Hi everyone, welcome to the closing webinar of the Imaging Science Series. Um, so we're about to get started um, and we have lots of cool images from researchers to show you and the ones that um, you all have sent in as well. So we just scrolled through a selection of those. Um, and with that, I'm gonna hand this over to Erica Reinfeld, who's going to uh, start us off. So. Thank you so much, Brian. All right. We are so excited um, to be here with you. Uh, so two weeks ago, we hosted the opening webinar. I am actually not looking at the poll, so I don't know how many of you attended it. Um, if you didn't, I hope you'll log on uh, to the museum site and check it out. Uh, we, had, we hosted that with two fabulous photographers, Keith Ellenbogen and Felice Frankel. Uh, and we are really excited to close this week out uh, with the research counterpart to that. Um, so our researchers, our guest researchers, will be sharing a couple of their own science photographs with you, um, images that came out of active research here at MIT, and then they'll be talking to you about some of the images that they saw on this two-week exploration that they found really intriguing. Um, before we jump into their presentations, I did want to call out a couple of the, op of the themes from the opening webinar uh, by contact for context for this conversation. Um, so one of the central ideas that we talked about was the idea of photography and imaging as a tool of science, uh, helping us to make observations and to communicate scientific ideas. Um, as science photographers, both Keith and Felice notice science everywhere, uh, but I thought it was really interesting. Keith identifies as an artist, Felice does not. Um, and so they both talked about the intentionality of a good science photograph um, and that it, the, an important element of that is being intentional about your photography, but also leaving yourself open to discovery. And I think that's very characteristic of a lot of the images we're gonna be looking at today. Um, one of the comments that came through in the chat that I really liked uh, was that many of the photographs that we saw were in some ways unintentional art. They weren't designed to be art, but they still had uh, an artistic component to it. It was a combination of the, inspect, uh, the expected and the unexpected that come together to tell a story. Uh, we also talked a little bit about maintaining the scientific integrity of a photograph, uh, of the scientific subject when taking a photograph, but then still using the photograph to tell a story. Uh, and then finally, we talked a little bit about uh, the value of bringing both people and ideas together to create a photograph and make sense of what's being represented in the world. So um, in that spirit, we're going to bring in our guests. Uh, and as they present their images, you are welcome to use the Q&A feature down at the bottom of your screen um, to address questions either to an individual or to the whole group. Uh, and we'll try to get to at least a handful of those after everyone has presented their image. So we're going to start with uh, Suda Kumari who uh, is a researcher at the Koch Institute where I work. Uh, you can see the public galleries behind me. This is our annual image awards exhibition of biomedical images. Uh, and I actually used uh, Suda's winning image from the image awards often to represent the image, uh, the image awards competition as a whole and just as a, an example of uh, a scientific photograph. So I'll stop talking and let Suda tell you and show you more. Hi everyone. Uh, so I am Sudha Kumari. I hope you are able to hear me uh, and hope you're having a wonderful weekend. So I am a research scientist at the Irvine Lab here at the Koch Institute of Integrative Cancer Research. And uh, in the Irvine Lab, we believe that our immune system is a powerful agent to fight diseases, different types of diseases like cancer and uh, autoimmune diseases. And uh, we also believe that when cancer develops, there's a compromised function of immune system. Somehow immune system is suppressed and that's how cancer progresses. And if we can actually equip uh, the immune cells or the cells of the immune system to fight better with the cancer, we can actually tackle cancer eventually. So what I'm gonna share with you today is actually image, which is actually a summarized story of my project that shows many different subplots in a single image uh, uh, as to which immune cells I'm using and how they're interacting with the immune cells or uh, with the cancer cells and how, what we hope to achieve uh, using this interaction. So I'll just briefly, uh, in a brief moment, I will share my uh, image with you guys. Yeah. 
So basically, my project started with trying to see how the immune cells, specifically the T cells, which are my ferret immune cells, because they can uh, directly recognize and kill cancer cells, how they interact, how they communicate, how they talk to the cancer cells, and are they able to actually kill cancer cells. So I took cancer cells, which are large cells shown here, there are two cancer cells here, uh, in a dish, and I threw some T cells that would actually recognize and kill the tumor cells, uh, and then let them interact. And it was a very interesting interaction to watch because I could see that T cells were actually attacking the tumor cells. And I had already loaded the T cells with these nanoparticles that have drug that would increase T cell function, that will increase the capability to fight these tumor cells. And I could see that the drug loaded T cells were beautifully binding to the tumor cells, so they were recognizing them. And they were able to actually kill tumor cells. So in the image, there are two different tumor cells, the one that is healthy and the other one which is sort of retracting, which is a sign of it being killed by the T cells. So in this image, uh, you could actually see different parts of the processes that entailed my project, which is looking at the interaction of immune cells such as T cells with the tumor cells, as well as uh, seeing how drug-loaded nanoparticles could help T cells in uh, the ability to kill tumor cells. And the idea was that if you can actually see this process in a dish, Hopefully, we were able to recapitulate it in the body sometime, in the models of cancer, and be able to take care of disease progression uh, in the real situation. Uh, so with that, I'd like to thank for you for your attention, and uh, we'll give it back to, uh, to give the speaker back to uh, Erica. Thank you. Thank you so much, Suda. Um, one of the things I love about this image is that it tells a very dramatic science story. It's a very good versus evil battle. Um, but it also is it's an image that really comes out of the scientific process. Did this experiment that we were doing actually work? Yeah. So our next image that we're going to look at uh, is also an image of documenting a scientific process. And it's really looking at the experiment a little more. So uh, I think, Matt, if you would like to get your image all queued up, uh, I'll turn it over to Matt Victor. Thanks, Erica. Um, just give me one second to share my image. Um, so my name is Matt Victor. I um, am a HHMI Hannah Gray Fellow at the Peakower Institute for Learning and Memory. And I have a PhD in neuroscience, uh, but a lot of the questions I'm interested in have to do with the developing brain. Um, and the approach I take is that I model neuronal development or brain development with stem cells. Uh, the field of stem cell has really uh, exploded um, in the past decade when the discovery was made that a fully differentiated adult cell, for example, a skin cell, uh, could uh, be reprogrammed to become a stem cell. And that stem cell can then be made into all known cell types in our body. Um, and that's uh, what we call induced pluripotent stem cells or iPSCs. So I work with iPSCs um, and I differentiate the stem cells to become neurons, which are uh, brain cells. And neurons have this amazing capacity to generate um, electrical signaling. And that's how information is processed in our brain. So what I'm showing you here is an image of nearly 20,000 neurons. Uh, the cell bodies are kind of white circles, um, but these uh, cells, they have a very unique morphology where they protrude extensions to make connections between different cells. Uh, so you can see uh, in here, it's um, a droplet of 20,000 cells that have been allowed to grow, um, and they were plated on a multi-electrode array. So these larger uh, black dots that are connected wires are actually reading uh, the electrical potentials that the cells are generated. Um, and I'm using the cells 
um, as a proxy for a developing uh, brain cell to understand how activity uh, shapes their maturation. So uh, as we develop, we received a lot of input, um, for example, sensory input, like your mother's touch. Um, and all those sensory inputs are uh, transformed into activity that's processed by the brain. Um, and there is reason to think that that's a very important part of developing a mature brain. So we're trying to mimic that in the dish. Um, and so I think this image is striking because it conveys a very difficult technique, uh, which is generating the cells from stem cells and getting them to be functional. Uh, but it also tells you a little bit about um, the interconnectivity of the cells. So you can see these meshes are connected uh, and some of the readouts of my research, which is to study how electrical activity changes with maturation in vitro. Uh, so I'll stop here and chat more later if you have more questions. Thank you so much, Matt. Yeah, um, when Matt submitted this to the Image Awards contest, he also submitted an image that was just the neurons. And it was a beautifully striking image, these glowing cell bodies and all these interactions and data that um, Matt was talking about. But the judges uh, chose this image because they loved how it documented the process of observing uh, as well. Uh, and one of the things I talked about in the opening webinar was making comparisons across different scales of science. And so with that, we're actually going to move in onto another image that also has a combination of the thing doing the observing and the, thi and the thing being observed. So uh, Calvin Leung is going to show his image. Yeah, thanks, Erica. Um, Hi everyone, my name is Calvin. Um, I am a PhD candidate and a member of uh, the Time FRB collaboration. So as you might guess, I'm an astrophysicist and uh, one of my biggest science goals is to uh, survey the night sky for these mysterious objects called fast radio bursts. And so these are brief bright radio flashes that um, are coming from all directions towards Earth um, and we think they come from outside the Milky Way galaxy. And so they're fascinating because they're just milliseconds long, but in that one millisecond or so that they turn on, uh, they can sometimes eat outshine their entire host galaxy. And so this makes them extremely powerful, but super mysterious objects to detect because they just come and go and you never see them again. So um, this is a picture of the Canadian hydrogen mapping intensity experiment. Um, or chime. Uh, and what we do is we have these um, these four cylinders, uh, which are shaped um, like so because they have an enormous field of view of the sky, unlike your regular telescope, which just stares in a tiny little patch of sky. So for reference, your conventional um, telescope that you might see, you know, on the mountaintops of Mauna, Mauna Kea or, um, or uh, at Palomar Observatory might have a field of view of about um, a 60th of a degree by a 60th of a degree. But with our radio telescope, with its, um, with its metal structure, um, uh, you know, with these, with these cylinders, which are each 20 meters wide and 80 meters long. Um, and the way they point at the sky, they can actually survey um, uh, a, a two degree wide strip of the entire night sky running north south. And so we have this massive barcode uh, scanner on the sky that um, surveys different parts of the sky as the Earth, Earth rotates beneath it. And so this unique design has allowed us to discover more fast radio bursts in a year than have ever been detected in the past decade. Um, and so this has really transformed the field. And so I wanted to include a picture of um, not just the night sky that we're so fascinated by, but also the unique instrument that lets us, uh, per that lets us perform these transformative observations. And so that's sort of the science side of this picture. Um, that on the aesthetic side, um, one of the things I really like about it is that it conveys a strong sense of purpose. Like you see these like massive metal cylinder structures and there's obviously some purpose to it. Um, and their regularity, you know, uh, uh, give, gives this sense of like unity and harmony um, that I think is really quite, that really sends chills down my spine, even though I think about this experiment every day. Um, also, I'm, I think on a more personal note, um, a reason I really like this image is because it, uh, you know, any, because I am 
uh, as, as a scientist, I'm really interested in instrumentation and the development of new, new instruments that can allow us to make uh, transformative new science observations, like the unique design of, um, of our uh, cylindrical telescope. Um, and so to me, every, every time you do astrophysics, it's a sort of communion between the telescope and the night sky. Um, and so I think this is just a particularly complete way of expressing that. It's not just the sky, but it's also what you use to look at it. And so um, in, com you know, in summary, those three things, um, uh, uh, sort of the, the, the science appeal, um, the, the, the sense of grandeur that you get, and also that, that sort of personal touch uh, make, you know, make me have this feeling that something, something magical is really going on here. And so that's why I chose this photo. Um, before I finish, I want to just uh, mention that I actually did not take this. This was taken by um, one of my very close collaborators, Andre Renard, at the University of Toronto. Um, so um, that's all I've got. Um, I'll pass it back to Erica now. Thank you. Thank you so much, Kevin. Yeah, one of the things I think is really interesting, so it's a photo of nature, it's a photo of technology, but somehow um, when you put all those things together, it's also a very human photo um, about our own mission to understand the world and to learn more about the world and create uh, things that help us appreciate um, what's going on in nature. Um, so with that, I think we're gonna shift gears to a different um, engineer, some different engineered cylinders. Uh, we're gonna head back to the biological scale and look at an image uh, of, of something that, that we built to not just understand how the body works, but also to improve how the body works. So Quinton Smith is our next presenter. All right, good afternoon, everyone. And thank you so much for joining um, today. My name is Quentin Smith. I'm a postdoctoral fellow at MIT's Koch Institute. And I work under the mentorship of Sangeeta Bhatia's Laboratory for Multi-Scale Regenerative Technologies. So in the particular um, research lens that I'm focused in is liver tissue engineering. So the liver is one, one of the coolest organs that actually has a unique ability to regenerate. You can actually remove two thirds of the liver and it will completely regrow. So we've actually taken advantage of that unique property for people who actually need uh, liver transplants for survival. So you can do something called a split liver transplant where you can take a liver from one person and put it in another and it can actually grow back on both of the patients. So one of the big difficulties within this field is that there is um, over 114,000 people in the United States that are in need of this life-saving surgery. So there's not enough donors to support this demand. So I'm actually a chemical engineer by training. So we can kind of think about how can we create engineering solutions to really bridge the gap between the unavailability of these organ systems. So in this work here, in this image here, I want to demonstrate one particular architecture within the liver as a way to create mini miniature livers in the lab that we can actually implant for patients. So there's like kind of a lot of um, different intricacies that were done to really create this picture. So what I'm showing here is an image of something called uh, a biliary duct. So this is a very important component within the liver that's actually responsible for carrying bile acid from the liver to the small intestines where it actually helps and aids, aids in digestion. So people who have liver problems, for example, they actually get something called jaundice where you have yellowing of the eyes or yellowing of the, the skin and nails. And this is actually that bile acid leaking out. So we understand this biliary architecture is very important. So what I'm showing in this image here are cells that make up the bile duct where we can control their architecture in a very specific manner. So this open structure that we can create is actually on the order of a human hair size. So these are around 150 to 300 microns in diameter. And how we do it, we use a pretty cool technique. We use acupuncture needles and we cast a biologically relevant material in which cells thrive in and use the acupuncture needles as a sacrificial mold. After we create this uh, mold with the extracellular matrix that, that builds up tissues, we can remove this really small needle and we're open with perfusible systems where we could seed with these biliary epithelial cells. So what I really like about this image is that we can, we can see that as engineers, that we can recapitulate the architecture of that we see in biology. So here's a proof of concept where we can create these very two standing structures that mimic the architecture of the liver itself. 
So I really like this picture and I hope you guys do. And I'm really excited uh, for the Q&A session afterward. And with that, uh, I'll give it back to Erica. Thank you. Thank you, Quentin. Yeah, I actually learned about, unlike many of the Image Awards uh, entries, I learned about uh, this project before I saw the image. And I made Quentin draw me lots of pictures of how it all worked. And then seeing this image just really illustrated you know, how important the photography was uh, for understanding these sorts of things. So um, our final image today um, is actually not an image that was taken through research, but is really an image taken of research. So uh, Lena, uh, Lena Colucci is going to share the final image before we move into Q&A. Hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Lena Colucci. I have a PhD from MIT and Harvard Medical School. I wrapped that up a couple of years ago, and since then, I actually co-founded a boutique data science consulting company called Edge Analytics. We're out in the Bay Area, and basically companies bring us in to help us solve their really difficult machine learning challenges. We work with big Fortune 500 companies, we work with some of Silicon Valley's top startups, and we're with them from early prototyping of potential solutions, de-risking, all the way to ultimately building and shipping the best ones. And the photo that I'm going to share with you today is one that has a really interesting backstory. So this is, um, I'm going to get into exactly what you're looking at in a second, but essentially one of my lab mates at MIT asked me to help her photograph um, her PhD research. And um, she works on novel cancer treatments. And essentially, um, she developed these materials that are filled with cancer treating drugs in them. And essentially, you implant these materials into the body and they slowly release these cancer treating drugs um, and provide the person's chemotherapy in a long-term way. The goal, however, is that you want to insert these implants to treat someone's cancer in as minimal type of surgery as possible. So you don't want to have a big surgery. Um, so she came up with the idea of creating these implants and folding them like origami so that um, this material can fold up really small and through something called a laparoscopic surgery, um, you can insert this material through a very tiny incision. But then once it's actually inside the body, the material opens up and can spread um, through a large area of the body and treat a big area of the body. In this case, it would be the abdomen. Um, so when she came and asked me to help her photograph these implants, um, it was a little bit challenging because the implants are white or transparent, so they don't necessarily photograph well. So, the interesting backstory is we came up with the idea of actually using origami paper itself and then playing around with lights to kind of help create these interesting shadows and coloring effects of these implants. So here you can see some of the behind the scenes photos that we took um, in creating this image. So playing around with um, squeezing the implants, um, different shapes, lighting, um, origami paper in the background, and what you can see is the different variety and um, types of images that we were able to take through these techniques. And this is an interesting video we took at the end that really kind of shows the beauty of these origami folds. Um, and really the clever part of her work is using this really ancient art form of origami to um, a new type of cancer treatment, something that can help people in the modern world today. So with that, I will pass it back to Erica. Thank you, Lena. Yeah, um, I, we wanted to close, with, close the sharing with that um, in part because um, Lena did such a great job of explaining kind of the choices that she made in taking these images. And even though this was kind of a macro scale uh, device, I think all the images that we are looking at today, there were choices made in how to set it up and present it. Uh, and that ties really nicely into this first question uh, that we've gotten on the Q&A. So again, I'm going to remind everybody that the Q&A window is open. 
Uh, so please submit your photos, whether for your questions, sorry, for uh, an individual or the group, but we're going to bring everybody back on screen now. Uh, and our anonymous attendee would like to know, oh, and let me note uh, that this presentation is being recorded. You probably saw it at the top of your screen, but we are recording it and we'll be posting this online with the other uh, imaging science tutorials and the opening webinar. But the question on screen here is, um, what advice would you give to other researchers or people trying out science photography about how to make their images more compelling? And anyone can take it. We're going to try the free for all and see how it goes. So I think one important thing just with scientific imaging is there are a lot of different tools that you can use, but I really think the narrative behind the stories really brings it home. So just from the other panelists, I was very impressed about your storytelling abilities. And I think really having that background and that story really elevates the meaning of those pictures. So for me, for example, when I show my friends pictures of cells, they're like, I don't understand what this is. But when you put it, when you contextualize it, I think that really elevates the importance of the picture. Um, I will add my own thoughts on it, but one of my um, advisors uh, at some point told me that I was trying to make my images too pretty. Um, and I think kind of appreciating the inherent noise and complexity and maybe ugly parts of biology. And by ugly, I just mean not uniform, not, um, you know, so tight. Um, kind of appreciating that that's there's beauty in that as well. I think that goes a long way. I guess I'll just add some thoughts from, from a purely, you know, photographic perspective. I totally agree with the narrative and the, what um, Quentin and Matt have said. Um, from a purely photographic perspective, it only helps to have a really high quality photo, right? So what that means is things in focus, really nice composition, um, lighting, crops, like that, having a beautiful, you know, doesn't have to be beautiful in the nice looking way, but a nicely composed photo um, with good technique uh, is what's going to make someone pause and be like, oh, wow, that's really interesting. What is that? Um, so good photographic technique really helps. Excellent. Thank you. Uh, we have somebody who would love to hear from you about how the process of imaging your science has helped shape your thinking about your research. I could take this one. Um, so I guess uh, every time I, I try to think of, an, uh, of you know, a research project or something, um, I try to think about how I will, you know, how, I, how, how my project makes sense in terms of like, um, or, or rather like what is the context of the project in the, broader, in the broader world. And so every time I do something, I think about like why people should care about this and uh, how I can present these results to the world um, and convince people that they are significant. Um, and I think that's actually a really helpful process um, because as researchers, you know, you know, we like go and read many papers and then we say, oh, well, there are like, you know, a hundred, you know, questions that seem interesting. But when you like sort of zoom out for a bit um, and think about how you're going to convey that to the world, um, I think it's uh, a really good exercise in learning how to triage your priorities. Uh, because oftentimes we're limited not by like what we can do, but what we have the time and um, where we want, best want to spend our effort doing. So that's at least one way that um, the, the process of not just imaging, but also communicating um, my ideas is uh, guides where literally what I spend my, my days doing. Uh, can I add a few words to what Calvin had to say? Actually, I completely agree with him. Uh, so my uh, research actually is largely imaging things as they're happening. Uh, so basically it relies a lot on basically uh, evidence gathering through looking at pictures. Um, and basically the part and parcel of the whole um, sort of imaging uh, techniques is that uh, there has to be accuracy in what you are imaging. And it actually tells you a lot about what to do next. So I often would have like tool parts that uh, I put into uh, a system and then image how they are coming together to in fact even know what could be the story and what to do next to even explore the story further. So uh, imaging is a very powerful tool for the scientific process and it can tell you a lot on day-to-day -day basis and that's 
uh, my projects generally involve that. Uh, yeah, so it can definitely change uh, your uh, scientific exploration to a great extent. Uh, yeah, so basically, uh, it is a very powerful tool and very powerful influencer in uh, many research areas. Yeah, we have a question from Rachel. How much do you think about your photos in the layout? Do you plan it out? I know, Suda, you just said you take pictures of things as they happen. Uh, but how about everybody? Do you, do you plan it out or do you take a bunch of image and test a lot of things until you find an image that works for you? So kind of just in my approach with science, we actually try to take as many pictures as we can. I'm looking at biological phenomena and as um, Matt was discussing, there's a lot of noise and a lot of background. So you really want to try to capture as many events as you can possibly, really dictating that phenomenon that you're trying to describe or observe. But then sometimes you have very unique things that pop out from those, the mosaic of images that you take. But generally in my approach, I try to take as many different types of pictures to really capture the phenomena that I'm studying. I think um, for me, uh, a lot of times I'm thinking about the magnification um, in which I'm taking the picture. Sometimes, you know, we want to get really close um, to an individual cell, but then sometimes we kind of want to take a step back and take a larger image, which might require um, like a composite of many images to be taken. So, and those, for example, the image I took probably took a couple hours to be able to acquire. Um, so I think a lot of times I play around with um, setting up this kind of like composites or individual and seeing what looks good. Um, I do have to say that all my images, I tend to think about they're going to be shown or seen as like a thumb size. Uh, these are going to be small little panels in like a much larger data rich, hopefully, <laughs> um, figure. But the idea, I, I sometimes the higher magnification is a little easier to show in, in a small inset. Great, anyone else? All right, so we have a question from Jody here. So obviously we're all taking these pictures because we love science and we're doing science and how important is the imaging when you're trying to get new funding or um, applying for a new project? What role do those images play? So typically when we uh, are trying to get new funding, we have to write grants and grants typically include preliminary data. And I think having a good image won't necessarily, um, you know, get you those uh, dollar bills, uh, but it's certainly uh, the comments I've gotten from uh, reviewers is that they would say this is really high quality preliminary data. And I think part of that lingo is about um, just the strikingness of the images, but together with a lot more uh, quantification and the story as a whole, it's not solely based on the image, but I think it goes a long way. Did anyone want to add to that? Great. Just one kind of minor note. Sometimes I really like the, the sentiment that seeing is believing, right? So it really just drives your point home. Like at least the, the type of work that I demonstrated really seeing the nice oriented structures is a really nice proof of concept to really drive some of your ideas home. So if you can even capture it in like a schematic, for example, just like the imagery and demonstrating really the validity of your, your proposal is really important. And then Suda, did I see that? Actually, I was gonna say what Kenton just said that I totally agree with it that uh, uh, part of the scientific imaging also evidence gathering. So an image is also a piece of really powerful evidence and it can demonstrate that uh, you, are, uh, you, you are able to basically capture the process to some extent for which you're asking money already. So it's, uh, it's also a piece of evidence and seeing is believing so yeah, it helps. Terrific. All right, we have a few more questions here, but what I want to do is actually move on to look at some of the images that were taken through imaging science. So if, um, and we'll have some time for Q and A uh, after as well. So we've asked every one of these five fabulous people to pick an image out of the gorgeous array uh, that was submitted uh, 
some of you saw those in the, the opening slideshow, but we've asked everybody to pick an image and we're going to just have a conversation about some of the images that uh, stood out to people and what they liked about them. And we're going to mix up the order this time. I think, Calvin, why don't we start with you? Sounds good. Thanks, Erica. Um, so I, I really like this photo of um, a pot of water on a stove. Um, and I, it actually really stood out to me, not because the subject was particularly unusual, like everyone boils a pot of water every day, but um, I think this is really indicative of uh, the scientific process in physics and astronomy, where a lot of the times there are processes that you want to observe and you don't have direct access to that. So if you want to see fire, you look at the pot of boiling water that's on top of it. Um, I think that's really the image here, right? You don't, like we all intuitively can make that scientific leap, you know, even without seeing the flames or without feeling the heat, you look at this pot of water, um, you look at the way the bubbles are formed. These are very different from soap bubbles. And you already know that there's like, a, you know, there's a phase transition between the, the liquid and the gas phases of the water. And that's probably caused by convection um, from below. And there's a heat source underneath that. And that's why we include that at the bottom of this, at the bottom of this pot, there is, um, there is, there is a gas fire um, uh, making, making these bubbles. Um, and so, you know, we, we prove the existence of fire every day just by looking at this image. And I think that's pretty cool. Um, I love that, the story within the story. Do any of our other uh, presenters want to comment on this photo uh, or what Calvin said? Uh, not everybody has seen each of the photos that everyone's picked. Yeah, I really loved this photo as well. I'm so glad you picked it, Calvin. Um, for me, what was really striking is when you first look at it, you're like, what is it? And then, you know, you take a couple seconds and you're like, oh yeah, this is boiling water. And for me that, you know, that instant of like some really interesting visual that makes you pause and say, what am I looking at? Um, like that instant, especially in a science photograph, is that opportunity to teach and learn, right? Because then someone's going to look at the um, title or caption and learn something. And this, as Calvin has expanded upon, it's an opportunity to teach, you know, about phase shifts or, um, you know, different phases of water and boiling and whatever the, the direction the photographer wants to take the teaching in. Um, it's this photograph is just an invitation for that. All right, well, now we're cooking. Uh, sounds good. I think, Quinton, I think you're up next then. So I might be a little biased in this picture. I'm from New Mexico, so immediately the cacti spikes like came out to me. But really, what I really enjoy about this picture is just the, the complexity in terms of the, the organization and the architecture. So you see a lot of order, you see the spikes in a very particular manner. And with the image across the, the purple backdrop, it really highlights the different, the, the different cacti. So I really enjoyed this image, not only from me kind of being a little homesick and reminding me of New Mexico, but also being able to capture the different architectures within the, the plant itself. Um, I just wanted to add that there's so many beautiful images of nature. Um, it seemed that a lot of people are very inspired by being outdoors. And I think especially when we're, <laughs> experiencing a lot of you know being locked up um, but I agree this is great yes uh, one thing that I didn't have time to talk about in the opening webinar and I'm gonna kind of jump in and hijack this a little bit and talk about my own graduate work in understanding how people make sense of images um, is what I did with my graduate work is I looked at how people make sense of science imagery using an arts education framework. And so one of the frameworks I used was the Tate Modern's Ways of Looking, uh, which says that we look at images in a variety of ways and artwork in a variety of ways. And the first thing we do is find that personal connection. And I, I heard that from, uh, from Quinton there. And then after that, we wanna know, we wanna look at the subject and say, well, what is this a picture of? Uh, what, what's going on here? What's happening? Uh, which is, of course, a key element of science. Um, but then even beyond that, people want to look at the object, at the photograph or the artwork or the, the composition as something that was delib deliberately created. What did you use to take this? What, why did you choose these colors? What's going on? What's, what are the physical properties of the image itself? Uh, and then the fourth way of looking is just looking at this wider context. 
why did we take this image? What was going on in the world when this photograph was taken? And I think that's something that really comes out in all of these photos. All right, Lena, would you like to share an image with us? Sure, let me share my screen. All right, so I've, I've touched on this before, but what I really love about photographs and especially science photographs is um, a photo that makes you pause for some reason. It could be like that it's this just a, a beautiful image. It could be that you kind of do a double take and you're like, what am I looking at? And then once you have that hook that someone's paused in the midst of their busy day, that's an opportunity to go and teach something. Um, and the reason I love this photo, and I guess I'll, I'll say before, before I dive into this one in particular, um, there were so many fantastic photos. Anyone who submitted a photo should be incredibly proud. There were so many really good ones. Um, I ultimately picked this one, A, because I thought it was so beautiful. The colors are stunning. The composition is stunning. It's this really ethereal quality of a photo. Um, and then, so it just made me pause. And again, then that's an opportunity to go and teach something. So I feel like the, once you have someone's attention here, it's an opportunity to teach about surface tension or um, ripple patterns and wave formations and equations for the, um, you know, crest and trough of waves. So there's a lot to, that kind of can be taught once you have that person's attention. Uh, so one thing that I really like about this image is that it freezes the motion, uh, which is uh, a very hard thing to do technically, and also is very beautiful to look at. So it's like a drop that's basically is frozen in time. And those images are actually very powerful because they're telling a story in time, but in one frame. So it beautifully captures that phenomena. And I think that's, that's a sort of very nice feature of this image that I really like. Yeah. All right, Calvin, why don't you go ahead now? One neat detail I noticed is that you'll notice that um, around the droplet, there are these two uh, rings of uh, water propagating outwards. Um, and the fact that the outer ring is um, much more um, is much more smeared out than the inner one tells you that the speed of surface waves on this water is different for different uh, for different wavelengths. So that's a pretty pretty non-trivial um, pretty non-trivial thing to notice just in this picture. So there's a lot of very interesting detail captured here. Terrific, thanks. Yes, I love the capturing of time and space in these things. And both of those things are essential for, for running a science experiment or what's happening in our world. Time and space matter. All right. But Matt, let's let's see your, your choice. I, I picked a few, but this one really spoke to me because I have this motto in lab that everything is data. So I carry my iPhone with me everywhere. And iPhone cameras are so good nowadays uh, that I kind of do this a lot where I put my camera um, onto the ocular of the microscope. And so you end up getting this kind of ring, which is the ocular, but then you get the image through. Um, and I typically will crop it, you know, and just use the, the image inside. But I love the fact that this tells a very um, clear message, at least to me as a scientist, of where that photographer was. I feel like I understand the process. I, I'm seeing it as the person saw it. Um, and, you know, there were, there were a series of images posted um, with the same um, kind of photograph from a microscope with just different um, maybe uh, substrates being image, but uh, I, I think that when you can uh, capture um, the, the process in the image, I think that could be really powerful too. So this is kind of what spoke to me about the series of um, phone to the ocular images. I have a comment on that. Uh, it's a great choice, Matt. Uh, I also like the part that the texture of the subject is so nicely visible in the image, which is not usually the case. Normally there's a compromise between contrast and texture, and here that doesn't seem to be the case. 
So it's really commendable effort on technicality and uh, it's a really great image. Yeah, I think that that comparison can be really powerful in image. Uh, one of the things we talked about with Keith and, Keith and Felice is making the decision of what to photograph and what not to photograph. And what you show is often dependent on what you don't show or uh, the choices you make of, of how you compare things. Absolutely. All right, Suda, is your, is your image ready to go? There it is. Uh, so apologies for the interruption. And so I, I like this image because like Lena was saying that an interesting aspect of the image is that uh, it may, it, it will incite you to stop and pause for a moment and think a little bit about the image, maybe the process of how it was taken, the story around it, and also the, the message that is coming through. And I felt that this image was combining a lot of different things and a lot of these different things in a nice way. So first of all, the composition is really nice. The objects, these rice grains are nicely placed. And even though they're, they're not brilliant in color, the colors are very nice. And, and uh, so overall composition is very, very nice. Uh, what I also liked about it is also my personal bias as a microscopy uh, person. So I like to see small things seen in better details, to see things that we can't generally see with the naked eye or ordinarily. So to see beyond what our eye, eyes can see. So for example, if I hold rice grain, I wouldn't know that's actually asymmetrical. So there, one side is a little more shaded than the other side. Uh, so this asymmetry I didn't know existed. And then what is this dark color? Is it where the embryo used to sit uh, or the, the fertile part of the rice grain, which again, I didn't know existed in a in a processed rice like this. So it's like a, like a collection of scientific messages that are encompassing this image. So I, that part I really liked. I also liked the technical mystery around it. So I really want to know how it was taken. Uh, there seems to be some back illumination happening, uh, but I'm not sure. Uh, so it seems like uh, the person who took the image uh, had a good sense of uh, technicality of how to basically illuminate these grains to get the most information out. So I really like that part. Yeah, so basically it's a combination of the composition, the visualization beyond what we'll ordinarily see, and also the, the trick that has been used here. That's why I really like this image. Thank you. Uh, would any of the other panelists like to comment on this image? Yeah, I was gonna ask what the little um, dark flecks are. There are these big dark um, dark spots, which you said, I think are the embryos of the rice grain, but there are also sort of these dark flecks. I don't, do you have any idea what those are or are those just like imperfections? Yeah, I know nothing about plants, so. Yeah, same, same here. I don't think about rice grains either. It's an interesting question. Maybe the, the participants could comment on it later or if any of you know about it. I don't know. It adds nice features to the to the grains, but I'm not sure what exactly they are. If I'm not mistaken, this image was posted on social media, which means okay. uh, it's there on the, the hashtag, and perhaps that's a, a nice conversation to begin uh, online. I love this idea of, we didn't really talk about this, but it was so important uh, that a good image provokes questions. Uh, and in some cases, we've seen those are questions about the details of what's being photographed, about the wider context and phenomena that's behind it, uh, looking for things we can't see. And, you know, like, clearly you all are scientists because you, you've got questions about these uh, and the photos both answer them and ask them as well. And I think that's really powerful. Um, I was just going to jump in to say that one of our attendees, Dora Beffer, um, is telling us this, these are the germs of the germ of the rice, and this is the part that will become the plant. So maybe this is her image or she's a rice enthusiast. Yes, I think this is Dora's image. Excellent, I can't see the chat. I'm, <laughs> I'm making sure my microphone is, is on and off. Um, but I can see the clock and I see that we are almost at two o'clock and I think any, all of us could go on and on and talk about what we love about images. Uh, there are a couple questions about what you use um, to, to take your photos, 
uh, what, what tools you like for photography. Do you use your camera, phone? Um, if you wanted to type in answers to that um, while Brian talks a little bit more about where we wanna go from here. Uh, this was a, a two week experiment with, with imaging science. Um, before I turn it over to Brian, I do wanna thank all of our researchers. Thank you so much for taking time out of your Saturday afternoons or mornings for those of you in California. Um, to share your images, your perspectives. I love the conversation that we had and the different perspectives uh, on both the research images and the, the MIT imaging science images. And I am so grateful uh, for all of you for joining in. Uh, the last question is, you know, what are the opportunities for students who want to continue pursuing imaging science? And so for that, we're obviously gonna leave uh, this content online, but I think I'll bring Brian back to kind of answer the questions about where where things are going from here. Yeah, thank you, Erica. Thank you, everyone, all of our panelists uh, for joining us today. And thank you to all the participants out there who have submitted some really incredible photos. Um, I think um, you did exactly what we were hoping, which was get out there, go around your homes, go outside and take some cool images, make some observations of things that you hadn't before through photography. Um, so this is our closing webinar for um, this section of imaging science, but please keep a lookout for um, more programming under the title imaging science or under the hashtag MITTM imaging science because we definitely like to continue um, doing things with imaging and um, imaging science photography and science into the future. Um, so we're gonna sign off now, but I'm going to throw up the slideshow of many of the images that have been submitted throughout the two weeks. So feel free to um, hang on for a few minutes and, and enjoy those images as they come in. Yeah, thank you to everyone who submitted images and thank you again to our panelists for, for helping us appreciate what makes great science photos. Thanks Erica and Brian for putting everything together. I'm sticking around because I'm excited to, to see all these images because I, I told myself I was going to be surprised uh, when they came on the slideshow, but thank you everybody.